this video I'm going to open up a Mabuchi motor which is the same sort of form factor that you'll find installed on a lot of cassette players. Um, my channel's about fixing Porter Studios, tasking on Porter Studios, Frostix, Yamaha, that kind of thing but the same sort of size of motor is going to be present in a lot of um, cassette decks as well. The particular one that I'm going to be opening up is a Mabuchi EG 530AD slash 2F. That's a 12 volt DC motor. It's rated for 2400 revolutions per minute and it turns in a clockwise direction. Bit of uh, supplementary information relevant to those of you looking at my channel in order to fix cassette multi-track recorders. Here's two transports. This one is from a 44 Mark II and this one's from a Porta 7. You notice that in the Mark II the motor is mounted from the rear with the pulley facing out towards the magnetic heads. Whereas on this one, um, the motor is mounted from the front with the pulley facing away from the magnetic heads. With this kind, then your motor is going to turn in a counterclockwise direction and with this one, it's going to turn in a clockwise direction. Both of these operate at up to three and three quarter inches per second. If your motor is rated for 2400 RPM, that's not going to be fast enough to cope with three and three quarter inches per second. This motor, because it's clockwise, meaning it would face forward like that and is only going to do one and seven eighths inch per second. This would be an adequate substitute for a motor on Porta 1, the original Porta 1, late 80s large black one with battery compartment as opposed to they made a Porta 1 later on which was like a little pared down 414. We'll discuss in due course what differences inside here contribute to these being 2400 or 3200 RPM as a maximum speed. What I found after opening a few of these is a lot of the parts are actually the same and the differences certainly in terms of the uh, maximum speed it'll take are to do with this little printed circuit board inside and the components on it. Okay, first step to disassembling this is to get this metal end cap off the motor. Basically we're going to be shoving a screwdriver or some other tapered implement into that space. If I were to go like that and just start turning there, you can see how easy it would be to snap this little protruding tab where the four input wires go. So what you want to do is push pretty deep in there so that any pressure is going against the internal part of this PCB which is much more robust. And in fact what I've found before is if I just push in far enough that's going to pop off. So let's see how we do. Well, that was kind of violent. The end cap and this bit of foam have just shot off into the windowsill over yonder um, but really that sits on top of there. Next step is to detach the PCB. Three solder contacts we need to desolder. This one just above my fingernail, this large one here and this large one here. If you've got that protruding tab towards you, then the two tabs are sort of at seven o'clock and one o'clock respectively. This one here, it corresponds to this bit just above my fingernail. So that's stopping anything underneath the PCB coming out of this case altogether. And it's connecting the case to electrical ground. The ones at 7 o'clock and 1 o'clock, they're soldering onto little metal tabs that join to the brushes. I'll talk more about that once I've got this out. What I tend to find works well is to introduce some fresh solder and then heat it up again and suck it away with a solder pump and then get the remnants away using desoldering wick. If your pulley is already removed, you could actually push from the bottom and the whole thing would come out. I don't recommend you do that. For repair purposes, you probably want to leave that like that with all the parts from this plastic cap and below still inside the chassis of the motor. In this video I will be removing those just to give you a better idea of what's inside. But if I jump ahead quickly, if I actually take that out. Getting this part to sit inside these brushes nicely after that's been removed can be tricky and you can end up warping those brushes and you've sort of rendered the whole motor useless. If you're going to repair these then probably what you're going to find most of the time is this chip here 
or the equivalent in whatever circuit board you're looking at is it overheated um, so you'll want to find a replacement for that solder it back in and then reassemble it without taking that out it's for demonstration purposes so that you've got a better understanding of what's inside here this plastic cap comes out there's a little metal what will we call that washer in there into which the end of this part sits um, two brushes We've got a fixed magnet inside this metal case and this part which will now a little bit of resistance obviously because that's a ferric metal and that's a magnet but this part comes out that's called the commutator let's break this down a little bit got a shaft that part there is going to sit in that little washer there here you can see that this is split into three segments either one or two of them at any, any time is going to be in contact with one or in contact with both brushes each one of those three contact segments is attached to one of these three armature windings these parts here don't actually make contact with the fixed magnet it's engineered in such a way that there's a tolerance anyway but even if i were to wiggle it like that, the magnetic force is pushing inwards from all directions and um, that's preventing any contact between these metal parts. Let's talk a little bit about roughly what these circuit boards inside these kind of motors are doing. Why would you have a 12 volt motor that turns at 2400 revolutions per minute and another 12 volt motor that turns at 3200 revolutions per minute? Surely the voltage is proportional to the speed. Well the other two inputs are the positive and negative side of your pitch control potentiometer and depending on the specification of a control chip that's on here the positive side of that can be significantly higher than 12 volts. On this particular chip for a motor rated up to 2400 revolutions per minute, um, that will actually take up to 14.4 volts without any risk of overheating and therefore prematurely dying. The equivalent chip on the circuit board for 3200 revolution per minute motor, this one will take up to 18 volts and that's got a hole in the back for heat dissipation. You basically there's a brass there that connects to the end cap of the motor and that's how it gets rid of some of the extra heat that's generated all the other components are kind of a supporting cast for one regular. And so it's managing the positive voltage that's going to the positive brush. One of the main reasons that it's doing that is, remember that there are three contact surfaces here, relating to three armatures, three electromagnets here. And an electromagnet basically means that if you put a electrical current through a coil of wire, it'll become a magnet. And so if we think about one of these contact segments, it's in contact with the positive brush, that gets magnetized and so this turns and it keeps turning until it hits the negative brush and then the charge drains away through the negative brush. It's important that there are three of these rotors and only two brushes because with three rotors then at least one of them is going to be in contact with one of the brushes at any time and that keeps the momentum of the commutator inside here spinning. However, because we're constantly fluctuating between there being one and then two and then one and then two and one and then two of these three electromagnets being activated, that creates a very rapid fluctuation in the rotation speed. In an audio application, if you imagine that this is basically turning the pulley, which is turning the capstan belt, which is turning the capstan, then you're basically putting sort of like warble onto the um, audio that's being recorded. So through electrical engineering magic, which I don't necessarily completely understand myself, but I don't think it's important from a repair point of view that you understand either. You can do your own research, as well as allowing different 12 volt motors to turn at different speeds. One of the things that this PCB is doing is compensating for that slight fluctuation in rotation speed and therefore pitch. So if you get a motor like this and it's not responsive at all, it's probably not a mechanical problem, you know, unless something actually got in and gunked up these brushes to the point where there was no electrical contact between that and the commutator. Unless it had been damaged in such a way that actually, like, I don't know, this magnet had got cracked and then it was actually preventing these from moving. The likelihood of there being a mechanical problem in a motor like this seems pretty low to me. Um, what probably causing it is your motor control over time being hot has kind of damaged the little microscopic inner workings of it. 
and it's maybe working badly, in which case there's a warble, or if it's shut down completely and then you may have an unresponsive motor. I do like to be transparent with people about what I do and don't know. I'm not an electrical engineer by qualification, and although I've spent significant time and made some money furbishing multi-track recorders, I've never been employed by anyone else as a technician or anything. So please do your own research, but I hope that seeing this opened up in a little kind of layman's discussion of what's happening in here has been helpful for anyone who's trying to diagnose and fix a, a cassette recorder.